That's all you missed was kindness. Um, I think, I, I suppose you've probably been noticing, but first Lynette and now Carolee have a camera set up. Uh, my my family are are on a YouTube channel, and and so I let I let the young adults of my family that are scattered scattered through the world participate in this class. Um, but also, um, many of you who are part of the Remind group got uh, got the mix up this week. I. If if you want reminders for this class, the code is at Reese three four one to eight ten ten, and I'll continue to send out reminders like I did today to uh, to tell you you know kind of what scriptures we're going to be following and and things we're going to be studying. And, and throughout the week, by the way, you can contact me through that app, and it's not replying to all. It just sends a direct message to me. If, if you would like to say, for example, could you, could you give us the source on that? You, you mentioned something, something I'd never heard that before. Where's that coming from? Just in case you're afraid I'm making stuff up. <laughs> Because there's a I've chance. I've harassed him before. Yeah. Not, not about that. <laughs> but if, but when I get when I get feedback, I, I try to respond. I let you know, and uh, and and so this is a good way for you and I to stay in contact through the week through our remind group. Uh, because I have because I have erred and or erred and given everybody my my weekly family come follow me. <laughs> if you. If you were to text at Reesfam12, I will adopt you <laughs> through the spirit of the Book of Romans, and uh, and and you can. I, I make little ten-minute uh, Loom videos every Monday for my families to help us with our Come Follow Me, because my you know my family are spread abroad, and I don't get to bring them all together for. Uh, or come follow me on Sunday evening and tell them all the things they should have heard in Sunday school but didn't. <laughs> What's the code again? <laughs> At Fam 12, that's where the 12 of us join together and now uh, the multitudes of, of the house of Abraham. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, and by CES policy, I don't want to be broadcast. I don't want my my uh, lessons to be digitized. Um, not because I'm I'm shy about it, or but but because uh, SNI uh, Seminaries and Institutes tries to be protective with this, so that. Uh, evildoers and, and antagonists don't get a hold of us and, and you know take things out of context or even take mistakes and explode them. Um, I am not error free when I when I teach the gospel or when I drive or when I eat breakfast. I we're just so to have things recorded and have somebody that can analyze them and point out the, the errors for the sake of evil, I just I just don't want to go public, you know. So I share you, I share with you my family code, and invite and ask you to also please, you know, not share that to the whole world. To my young adults who are watching, I would like to invite you guys, uh, in the spirit of Elder Rasband, Sunday night in the Spectrum, Elder Rasband with all the the young single adults in uh, or the young adults in Cache Valley. He asked them to stand up if they were not registered in institute. <laughs> and and three quarters of the spectrum stood up. Oh wow. They admitted it. Yeah, it's it a cool moment of honesty. <laughs> and then he challenged them to sign up. Well, uh, not everybody in that congregation are USU students. Not everybody in that congregation or uh, you know adjacent to the campus. Uh, I try to help Institute in Preston and Providence and Smithfield and Malad and Brigham City to have their own programs and as part of that is this class and so lest Elder Rasband shout at my kids 
please go to institute in, in logan.org you can search by uh, by teacher and it will bring you to this class register for this class i will send you homework messages uh in, in personal messages all right you can get credit Elder Rasband won't yell at you, and you can go to heaven. <laughs> For the rest of you, work out your own salvation if you're in family. I'm not your parent. Um, so let's get back to Harmony, Pennsylvania. Last week, we, we got into Harmony, and, and I, I hope that centering the TV helps a little bit um, so that you can... Uh, you know, see this screen and including the quotes and things as they come up. But we talked about Emma in harmony and a revelation that was directed particularly to her. And and because it is uniquely a revelation to women, and this class is primarily women, I'm glad we orbited that for quite a while. I don't know that we need to spend so much time on the revelations from for today unless you have thoughts and insights and you, you'd like us to park there for a while. But we'll start with things that were happening to Joseph Smith in 1830, in the summer of 1830. He gives us an interesting clue in 1842. In 1842, he's writing about the Restoration. And, and in section 128, maybe you remember the, the words of the Revelation are familiar. He says, and what do we hear? Words from Camorra. And he kind of goes through the, uh, the restoration in verse 20 it says and again what do we hear and then one of the, the points that he makes is that at some point during the restoration he heard the voice of Michael on the banks of the Susquehanna detecting the devil when he appeared as an angel of light <clears throat> now from church history standpoints that that's isolated that's not in journals that's not uh, it's not in places but but we know that Joseph Smith said that but in 1842 he said it so let's let's do a little work together and by the time we're done uh, with the way I put these slides together you will either feel like a conspiracy theorist or like a TV detective because we're gonna we're gonna try to connect a lot of things so let's take that revelation or that uh, thing out of the Doctrine and Covenants and we're gonna draw a string on it to Joseph Smith and Newell Knight's experience from two weeks ago, right? Remember, two weeks ago, uh, Joseph asked Newell to pray, and Newell had an experience with the devil. Now that kind of gets left hanging, unless we look last week at the trial in Bainbridge. In the Bainbridge trial, Newell Knight swore in open court, Joseph Smith cast a devil out of him, and said how the devil looked, said the devil was a body of light and gave a, re a, a relation of the whole process and said an angel of light or some holy being direct from heaven told him it was the devil. Well, boom, I think we've done a nice historic connection, right? With, with putting these posters on the board and drawing line, then, you know, using yarn to connect them, just like detective shows. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, Joseph Smith's Colville trials, and that's when that's that slide. So let's connect that. And then in section 24, section 24 is almost a throwaway. Section 24 is a revelation where the Lord tells Joseph Smith to spend his time uh, strengthening the church in Colesville. But but uh, there's this line in it where the Lord reminds Joseph Smith, thou hast been delivered from all thine enemies. In July of 1830, what would that have meant to Joseph Smith? Well, he would have thought about the Colesville and the South Bainbridge trial and the mob persecution that he had just faced in Colesville, right? I love this, that the Lord's telling Joseph Smith to go back and minister in Colesville, and he leads out by saying, has been delivered from mine enemies in Colesville. Go back into the lion's beast, or, or, or the lion's den, the mouth of the beast. Don't be afraid, because you've been there before, and thou hast been delivered. What a good life lesson that we can remember. And thou hast been delivered from the powers of Satan. If, you, if we read that casually, we'll say, oh yeah, 
Uh, Joseph Smith has overcome temptation. Joseph Smith has overcome trials. No, the Lord is specifically referring to a particular instance where Joseph Smith was delivered from the powers of Satan when the devil was cast out of Newell Knight. But when the devil was cast out of Newell Knight, now that we're adding all of this stuff together, what did Newell Knight see? A personage of light. Personage of light, well, that can't be Satan, right? Until a heavenly being appeared and cast out that, that demonic personage of light. Oh, my goodness. The, what do we hear? The voice of Michael on the banks of the Susquehanna. So we add that, and let's see what else we can... Uh, what other conspiracies show up? <laughs> so, <clears throat> Joseph Smith uh, and Newell Whitney in August go to uh, the, the Knight House for a confirmation meeting. And uh, they're going to confirm Sally Knight and Emma Smith. And while they're gathered together, they decide they ought to have a sacrament meeting. And so, uh, section 27, Joseph Smith goes out to get some wine. And while he's on this errand to get wine, an angel appears from him and tells him uh, not to because whatever wine he gets is going to be tainted and teaches him the true principle that uh, it mattereth not what thou shalt eat or what thou shalt drink. A lot of times we stop reading the Doctrine and Covenants, section 27, and we learn that and we say, well, you can use water if you want. And you can use potato peelings like uh, the, the German saints were doing after World War II when Elder Ezra Taft Benson found them. Or like a weird time in uh, uh, Tarmabamba, Peru, when a young branch president and his companion forgot to bring bread for sacrament meeting. So I told Elder Saios, hey, go to the store and get some bread. But the store, well, not a store, the, the bodega, was out of bread. So he bought Paneton. And because we didn't trust the agua, and there wasn't bottled agua, Elder Savayos came back with Coca-Cola. So we blessed and sanctified the Coca-Cola and the sweet bread, the Paneton. And uh, I believe it counted. I didn't, I, I said water. Because I, I felt a little blasphemous to say, <laughs> and I trusted it was the water inside the Coca-Cola that was being saved tonight. So did they want that every week after that? They did. They did. Because we were like over four branches, and so we would go to, we and, and then Tarmabamba, we'd hike into this little village, and then we would go around the village and knock on the door of all the members and tell them to come to church. And uh, we just tell the church in somebody's basement. And uh, the next week, we went and we started setting up and people just started coming. <laughs> <laughs> it mattered not what thou shalt eat or what shalt thou shalt drink. That's a cool doctrine. But then, then the revelation goes on, citing a time when the Lord will partake of the fruit of the vine again with his servants, including also with Michael. Or Adam, the father of all, the prince of all, the ancients of days. Now, you that doesn't surprise you at all. You've kind of known this stuff. But in the summer of 1830, that little Protestant convert, Joseph Smith, he's heard of Adam, and he's heard of Michael, the archangel. And now, by revelation, he hears, oh, and he's heard, maybe heard of the ancient of days from Daniel chapter 7, right? But now, in Revelation, a little algebra is done for him. And he learns that Adam is Michael. Well, here's a, this is a side tangent now. Don't get distracted by these slides. But uh, Michael, the archangel, is also Adam, the first man, who is also the Ancient of Days. The Ancient of Days in the book of Daniel, chapter 7, uh, usually is depicted as, well, as the old man. But the old man, in a, lot of, in a lot of artwork, holds a compass, and he's drawing into a square with a compass. The Ancient of Days is a representation of the Almighty Father, who controls heaven and earth, who sits in the heavens, the compass, right? 
And uh, the, Daniel says that the, the Son of Man, or the human one, or Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, would come and, and pay homage to the Ancient of Days. Now, that is a representation of our Heavenly Father. But we learn by revelation here that Adam is a symbolism of our Heavenly Father. Right? Don't, don't, mis and we'll talk about this in just a hair, but don't mistake Adam for our Heavenly Father, but look at Adam and understand our Heavenly Father. Does that make sense? Now think about how many connections there are to that. Adam. The Hebrew name Adam means man. And who is our Heavenly Father? Man of holiness is his name man he is the angel Michael Mikael in Hebrew which means life unto God light unto God Michael Adam the ancient of days who lived to be 996 I don't remember 990 something right all of those all of those things are to make us think about God our eternal father you know what that changes in Joseph Smith's little mind everything St. Augustine said about humanity St. Augustine says original sin that, uh, that what Adam and Eve did was horrible wrong and made all mankind guilty by implication because they broke the first covenant and ate the fruit Adam right that's St. Augustine Adam and Eve are, uh, are bad Adam and Eve are dumb God just told Joseph Smith Adam is a symbol of your heavenly father St. Augustine is wrong Martin Luther teaching that because of original sin there is no free will all a wicked person can do is choose to continue to be wicked until God saves them by his grace. John Calvin said, humanity is in total depravity. And Jonathan Edwards said, God despises you. He loathes you like you would hate some spider or some abominable creature that you hold in your hand, sparing from the, the fire, not because the spider deserves it, but only because you are gracious. Everything Everything traditional Christianity has said about humanity since the 400s just went out the window. Can I have an amen? amen. <laughs> now, sometimes we Latter day Saints and our forefather converts held on to a lot of this, held on to a lot of Protestantism. By the way, the leaf is my design. That, that didn't come from my grandchildren. <laughs> yeah, I'm good at slides. <laughs> Sometimes we hold on to that, that, that Protestant and traditional Christianity idea about humans and about fall, right? The fall of Adam and Eve represented the path to their deification and exaltation. But my fall makes me horrible. My fall has made me repulsive. My fall has made me totally depraved. Right? No, if the fall of Adam and Eve is a glorious thing, then our mistakes, when repented of through the atonement of Jesus Christ, become our platform for learning, which becomes our pathway to exaltation. Right? That's what's affected me and will continue to affect me till my 85th birthday. Oh, honey. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the Artful Intelligence app was more generous to Carolee than it was to me. <laughs> but I actually look at it and I think, oh, I bet that's what I look like. <laughs> uh, same suit. <laughs> now, 
Now, let that blow your mind. Let that, let that help you understand how phenomenally different the restored gospel is from traditional Christianity. In all the ways where we sit around and say, uh, you know, you believe in Jesus, I believe in Jesus, we're all the same. True. We are a lot the same. And I admire everything of goodness in the evangelicals and the Catholics and, and everybody. But we are worlds apart when it comes to understanding the fallen nature of humanity. We believe we need the atonement of Jesus Christ like we need air. But not because we're totally depraved. Because we have the potential of exaltation. Right? That ch changes the way we think about ourselves when we make mistakes. I'm not dumb. I'm just new at everything. I'm not a horrible person. I'm just learning. Right? It changes the way we treat our children and the kids in our Sunday school class and the drunk on the street. It changes the way we treat people who are making bad decisions when we know that the only bad, bad decision is the one that isn't changed. Now, this doctrine blows my mind. It also affected one of my icons and heroes, uh, President Young. So President Young, before President Young was a Latter-day Saint, what was he? He was a Methodist. Yeah, he was Wesleyan. He spent his life thinking, thinking about traditional Protestant doctrines. He had learned those things. He'd been indoctrinated. So when he sees a verse like this, that Michael is Adam, the father of all, the prince of all, the ancient of days. Who is the ancient of days in Brigham Young's mind? God the Father. So President Young does this equation and says, oh my head. If Adam is the ancient of days and the ancient of days is God the eternal father, then Adam is God. And it becomes... If, if, if none of you have ever heard of the Adam God doctrine. Know where that comes from. Yes. I did, I've heard of, I, I had a friend that was asking me to ask her. Because she, because she was an Adam God person. Man. <laughs> and they she, eventually, she was secretly baptized. Well, because the policy was changed. <laughs> not because. Not because she changed her mind. No. <laughs> Brigham Young's mindset, as he's trying to figure this out, he gives this in a talk where he says, Adam is our father and our God and the only God with whom we have to do. But it's because Brigham Young uh, and other talks really believe this. He believed that Elohim had a son. And the son of Elohim is Jehovah. And the son of Jehovah is Michael. And the son of Michael is Jesus. Now, we know that's not the truth. We know that it's the truth that that's what Brigham Young thought because we have it in his discourses. But we know it's not the truth. And why do we know it's not the truth? Further light and knowledge. I wish all of us could learn this principle of a continuous restoration. We President Nelson has more a restoration than President Young did because of John Taylor and Wilfred Woodruff and Lorenzo Snow, right? God continues to speak to his prophets and, and things get fixed. Well, in that spirit, even though Brigham Young said that, look at what he was teaching in the rest of that same discourse in the Journal of Discourses when he was trying to teach about Adam and God. He was trying to teach the anthropomorphic personhood of God. That supreme deities are actual people who have posterity. Right? That's different. That's different from all religions. He was trying to teach the plurality of godliness, which is a very, very difficult thing for a monotheist to comprehend. Right? Even though we believe in one true God, there are gods many. He's teaching 
a heavenly hierarchy of gods. That there is a father and there is a son. He's teaching the theophany of Adam Michael. This is from a previous semester. Anybody remember your Greek for theophany? <laughs> God becoming. The, or theophany of seeing God. I mistyped. You were right. I mistyped theosis is what I wanted to type. Huh. Theosis. The God becoming of Adam. He wanted to teach the divine fatherhood and motherhood. And he was teaching... Uh, the exaltation of mankind and that Jesus Christ was not begotten of the Holy Spirit so here's a true principle that we need to learn about prophetic, uh, prophetic fallibility that's a concept that's being talked about a lot a lot of people talk about prophets aren't always right because we need to help people who are stuck on an Adam God point that Brigham Young said to not leave the church point is Brigham Young said it and it was incorrect but don't throw Brigham Young away because one aspect of what he taught was incorrect when everything else that he was trying to teach is very deep and very true theology to Latter-day Saints. Brigham Young knitted a beautiful theological blanket for us and we found one loose thread. Right? Don't pull the loose thread. Don't ruin the blanket. In fact, cut the loose thread, tie it off, keep the blanket. Does that make sense? If there is anything else in your life or the lives of people that you serve and minister to that is freaking them out about our church history because a prophet said something that later on proved to be incorrect, would you help teach them the principle of the blanket and the loose thread? That one loose thread does not ruin the blanket. And then people will say, ah, mm, but Wilfred Woodruff said, God will never let his prophet lead his people astray. To which we say, this isn't astray. This is just nomenclature. Brigham Young didn't ruin the idea about God in heaven and his son Jesus Christ. Brigham Young only mixed up names like we do. I can't call five of you by name and eight of you are my relatives. <laughs> right? Bless you, President Young. Any questions? I told you, I told you today, it was true doctrine and false doctrine, and we're going to mess with you. So let's go back. Let's go back to the Ancient of Days. Where do we hear about the Ancient of Days? Well, we hear about the ancient days in Daniel chapter 7. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, a human one, Jesus Christ. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the ancient of days and would have led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is everlasting, a uh, dominion that will not pass away in his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Around uh, 539 BC, uh, written down in 167 BC, Daniel has this prophecy of the Son of Man and the Ancient of Days. Well, in Doctrine and Covenants 107, in 1835, the Lord said that once upon a time, Adam, as an incredibly old man, brought his posterity together and there the Lord appeared unto them. And they rose up and blessed Adam and called him Michael, the prince, the archangel. And the Lord administered comfort unto Adam and said unto him, I have set thee to be the head. A multitude of nations shall come of thee. Thou art a prince over them forever. The, uh, the exaltation of Adam. Which also, don't you envy his posterity? who stood there and called him Michael. Physical creation, physical creation is really the veil. It blinds us to truth. It blinds us to things as they really are, as they really were, and as they really are to come. Can you imagine looking at your incredibly aged ancestor and said, I know you. You are an archangel. You 
are Michael. Wouldn't that be fun to turn to the left and to the right and just say, let me take away this physical creation and let me see things with spiritual eyes. I know you from work. We're friends from work. I recognize you. You and I have spent time together. You are not you. You are an angel. You are divinity. You are powerful. I might just look into the mirror and say that in the morning. Brother if I weren't Reese, talking back to me. Brother Reese, I'm stuck back on um, the devil being able to um, be seen as a personage of light or a, a light. I'm coming back to that. Okay, thanks. Can we? Okay. Okay, yeah. <laughs> because if we stay on this line of thought for another second, we understand something that the Savior said at the Last Supper. At the Last Supper, the Savior breaks the bread and gives the wine, and then he tells the apostles, I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The Savior tells his apostles, there is going to be a sacrament meeting that you were invited to in my Father's kingdom, which will be the next time I take the sacrament, right? Or participate in the Seder. The next time I have this holy meal will be in my Father's kingdom with you. And then, when the saints are in Missouri in 1838, the Lord told Joseph Smith that Spring Hill, a little area called Spring Hill in Davies County, is named by the Lord Adam on Diamond, because, said he, it is the place where Adam shall come to visit his people, or the ancient of days shall speak as spoken of by Daniel the prophet. And so, section 27 about uh, the Lord taking, or, or the Lord drinking with Michael connects us to uh, section 107 and Adam's moment with his posterity, which connects us to the ancient of days in Daniel, which connects us to uh, the Savior and the Last Supper, which all connects to Adam on Diamond. We have a prophecy. We have a pre precedence. We have a promise. And we have a location. Section 27 goes on to say, who else is going to be at the guest list for this sacrament meeting, doesn't it? So with Moroni. With Michael. With Peter, James, and John with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and then with all those to whom the Lord, all those who the Lord has given unto me. Now remember your section 25 last week. What did, what did Jesus, what did the resurrected Jesus call Emma? An elect lady. But what made her elect before he called her the elect lady? He called her my daughter my daughter adopted by covenant into the house of Jesus Christ says Paul in the book of Romans right adopted by covenant as a son or daughter of Jesus Christ says King Benjamin by the covenant ye have made ye are sons and daughters of Jesus Christ how did we become sons and daughters of Jesus Christ did he beget us no the father gave us to him so who is he invited to this sacrament meeting all these dispensation heads and my family my covenant family who have joined my covenant by the covenant of rebirth that's awesome if they ask who wants to pass the sacrament I do I don't want to be number one though sisters you may not know this but number one is the scariest of all sacrament passing positions <laughs> because number one goes on the stand and has the responsibility to give the sacrament to the, uh, the presiding officer which was always easy when the bishop is by himself but when there is any other random old man on the stand <laughs> I don't know what to do you would think everybody knew who the state presidency was you could tell the difference between the state president and a high council right you would think 12 year olds can't <laughs> Not true. <laughs> uh, 
Oh man, so many times, so many times in religious life, I have been, done, or watched this. <laughs> right? Can you imagine what this sacrament means? It's supposed to be? You, you walk up to uh, Joseph Smith. <laughs> Abraham. <laughs> Adam. <laughs> so I'll take the fruit of the vine again. I'll take the fruit of the again with you, no, the kingdom of my father. I want to be there. I want to, I want to, I want to be there. I love going to uh, Adamond Island now, which is one of the places the church has purchased and is improving, but improving kind of as a livestock, uh, a uh, agricultural facility. It's, it's for produce, but it is beautiful. And the intention is for us to go there without missionaries, without tour guides, and without visitor centers, and stand there and look over a valley and say, I want to be there. This is real. This is all connected. And now back to good stuff. Oh, oh I have um, the Spring Hill. We were there last year, and I didn't know there was a, a temple a site dedicated at Spring Hill. I, I don't know how I missed that, or do, what? When did that happen? The, the Quorum of the Twelve dedicated a spot to be a future temple in in that community, in that small little community. Joseph Smith's uncle John had a farm. Lyman White, the future apostle, had a had a place. John D. Lee had a ferry. There's a lot of good saints that were living there. And Brigham Young and the Quorum of the Twelve dedicated a temple spot to be there someday. I think I think that what they were dedicating was not a place for a brick and mortar building to be built because we don't have a revelation like we do for Far West and Kirtland and Nauvoo. I think the Quorum of the Twelve were dedicating Spring Hill as the house of God. The, the hill. Uh, I'm, I, that's that's 100% theory, but I think that's part of it. That's a good question, though. Anything else on this? Well, then, um, let's go back to the, this confirmation, uh, the confirmation meeting where... Uh, they learned about Adam, the father of all. And let's add it to one more thing that Joseph Smith learns during this summer, and then we'll come back and we'll answer the previous question. Because at the same time that all this is happening, and now, now you know where we're back to, right? We're back to the devil appearing as an angel of light. Joseph Smith gets a handbook. Whoop. Let's go the other direction. Joseph Smith receives the revelation of Moses. Moses chapter 1. Moses has a vision where he sees Almighty God. And then after the vision closes, he is approached by the devil, by Satan, who asks Moses to worship him. And Moses discusses the nature of the glory that he saw in God versus the natural vision that he can look upon the devil with, right? It came to pass that when Moses had said these words, behold, Satan came tempting him, saying, Moses, son of man, human one, worship me. And it came to pass that Moses looked upon Satan and said, Who the heck are you? For behold, I am a son of God in the similitude of the only begotten, where is thy glory that I should worship thee? We know the devil appears to us in darkness and tells us and whispers to us to be angry, to be proud, to be greedy, to be jealous, to be lustful. We recognize his voice when those things come to us. When the voice of meanness and pettiness whispers in our ear, we say, ah, devil, I know that's bad. But does he still appear to you and I as an angel of light? Does he still appear to us in goodness with an intent to push us a little too far, make us a little too fanatic, make us a little too radical? 
and then he reels us in. Think about any ism that you would like to, and think about how much good there is in it, and think about how much evil there is in the extreme of it. To embrace, to embrace the thoughts or the platforms of a political party. Think how much good there is in it. And then worry about that one or two things that the devil wants you to take to the extreme. Because then he's got you. Bless their hearts. Bless their hearts for everybody who has left the faith when President Nelson asked people to get vaccinated. I was just coming to Happy Valley. <laughs> it, uh, man, I know that it conflicted a lot of political opinion. A lot of political opinion. I know it conflicted a lot of uh, uh, scientific understanding for some. But the extreme, the extreme reaction to it cost people their connection to God's prophet. A good thing, a, a positive thing. <clears throat> In some cases, some friends of mine who have, who, have, who have taken a conservative bent in their life, right? Because I don't believe in abortion. So I step to the right. And I don't believe in this, and I don't believe in this, and I don't believe in this. And all of a sudden, I hate poor people and I hate immigrants. And I, I, I just don't believe anybody should be helped. I know I overstate the, uh, the Republican platform, but I'm close to it, you know it. <laughs> that which is good, when taken to the extreme, is the angel, is the devil appearing to us as the angel of light, trying to fake us out. I know that a relationship between a man and a woman is sacred when it is within the bounds of matrimony. And the devil comes, the devil comes to people as an angel of light and says, but you love each other. Right? Love. What can be wrong with love? The devil appears as an angel of light. What do you think? I'm still thinking. Processing, yeah, that's interesting. We know that's literal. We also know that it's the whispering in our mind. Joseph Smith does tell us not to be faked out if at any time we receive an angel as an angel of light and we don't know for sure if it's a divine one, right? There are two tests. One test given to us by Moroni and the other test given to us by Joseph Smith. First test by Moroni. If it is of God, it will teach, testify, prophesy, and... and other things of Jesus Christ. That is an angel of light. It bears witness of Jesus Christ. That's test number one. The angel of light does not say worship me, right? The second test, says Joseph Smith, is the test of the handshake, which means more to us. But it's the reality that a, a, a disembodied angel uh, it cannot be felt. And a disembodied angel of light won't try to trick you. Mostly, mostly they just high five me, and so I don't need to bother with the handshake. <laughs> oh, bro. And I'll say, Remember us? I say, No, not really. And I say, No, no. You were an angel of destruction. Oh, that makes sense. So why, why do you think they'd be allowed to? To, uh, to be allowed to do these good things, you know, where he's darkness, light, I like it separated better. <laughs> it is, uh, it is power and knowledge. There are people who with, with gifts of psychology and human understanding can seem as if they are prophets and seers, right? They know how to, they know how to make it look like they're reading your mind. They know how to make it look like you randomly picked the Queen of Hearts. Right? Um, 
That's the trickery of it. And he knows, he knows how to use that trickery. Mostly because, mostly because he used it before he became the fallen one. When he was Lucifer, the light bearer. He, he, he knows the equation. Is that? Yeah, that helps. We also are told that we, as individual members of the church, need to know and understand communication from the Holy Ghost. And I remember being hearing in a meeting that even when we are having a new prophet or a new bishop or a new whatever, that it's up to us to get that confirmation that that is right and so that thing thing could be put in place with an angel of light we question it if we don't have that confirmation thank you isn't this there's your detective board <laughs> this all connects to the the uh, revelation of moses the reality of the devil the reality of the devil's treachery and and uh, mean-hearted sneakiness and deception, and our capacity, says Moses, says Adam or Michael, says Moon Knight and Joseph Smith, our capacity to overcome. That's a, that's our message for today. I got four minutes. You ready to go to Manchester? <laughs> <laughs> what happens in Manchester? That's the uh, Palmyra. That's the hometown, right? During the summer of 1830, things are going on in Manchester, including Section 22. Joseph Smith's father is baptized, and when Joseph baptizes him, baptizes him, he weeps like a child. He's broken up because his father, who was the uh, the unchurched of his family. His father has received the gospel. His father, who was a fighter and a drinker, has received the gospel. We spoke before in this class how there are those that, that have had problems as the historians have undug ideas that Joseph Smith, the theme, Joseph Smith Sr. had a disreputable past or, or maybe a depressed past that, and self-medication. Um, a melancholy soul. That seems to be more the case, but I, I, I hate seeing him as a drinker. He's Joseph Smith Sr. No, go ahead and look at him as a drinker, and then look at this moment, right? But everybody drank in right? those days. Everybody, everybody drank. Everybody. If the historians are right, he, uh, he laughed everybody. <laughs> he drank so that everybody, the drinkers said, well, that guy can drink. But, <laughs> and he stopped. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he stopped. Whether that is your Uncle Fred that you hope will come back to the gospel someday, whether that's your ancestors on the other side of the veil, whether it's your ministering brother that's covered with tattoos and won't come to church, whether it's your own child who has decided that they don't like anything of Mormonism, everybody can change. And especially, especially us. I'm sorry, so so much today. Um, we, we have somebody in our ward that has done just that. Jail, drugs, drinking, tattoos, and in the last seven months, switched it all around. It's been so cool. Right. He, he's baptizing his daughters um, on Saturday. And Saturday, no matter what he looks like, I hope there's nobody that sees him in the water and sees jail, drugs, problems and, and weakness have they see a servant of the most high well i remember back in nauvoo we had a brother that came to do baptisms of the dead that was so covered with tattoos we you know put a shirt on him because there's a group of youth coming in at the same time and we were afraid of how the youth would perceive him and you know what the youth were from his ward and they ran up and just hugged him and hugged him uh, it was it was kind of a, a, a an overreaction by temple workers, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, we could have left him be, and that might have been the great thing for the youth to have seen. Yeah. I yeah. was at the window. <laughs> <laughs> I truly, truly, truly hope 
that when I stand and teach the gospel, nobody sees Kurt Reese, the junior in high school. <laughs> you know, I wasn't bad. I was making this confession, no need to suppose me guilty of any greater malignant sin, a disposition to commit such is not of my nature. But I associated with Jovial Company. <laughs> I associated with Jovial Company that may have may have been arrested in modern day for Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> and may have uh, been on a terrorist watch list. Because <laughs> I had I had fertilizer. So <laughs> I had diesel fuel. <laughs> I didn't blow up any courthouses, but I left a hole in a field. <laughs> <laughs> But I bear my testimony. I'm not that guy. I don't have the same desires. I don't have the same goals. I don't think about the universe from the same way. And when I am back to that picture that you saw of Kurt Reese at 85, I honestly and sincerely hope that I look back and say, I hope nobody judges me for my 50s. I was working pretty hard to be a disciple in my 50s, but man, I have changed. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. The continual promise of, of evolution, of change, until theosis, until we become like unto our Father in heaven. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, how grateful we are for the chance to come and gather and to study more. We are grateful for our Savior and for the atonement and for the chance to have revelation that continues to help us to change and we ask you that we'll be able to see our other brothers and sisters as thou would have us see them we do this in the name of jesus christ amen, amen. thank you caroline <laughs> as a junior i also knew uh, about uh, manure purple paint and bear river <laughs> 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 <laughs>